Okay. Welcome everybody. My name's Jenny Fuster. I'm the Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences Research Data Commons Program Manager for the ARDC. So we're going to get started. Um, but before we do, bear with me. So I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And just to let you know that I live and work on Ghana country. I'd also like to introduce Rosie Hicks, our CEO, who's here to participate in the Q&A at the end of the session. And Rhys Williams, my colleague who's here to assist today. Um, I'd like to introduce Jill Ben, Kylie Brass and Chris Hatherley, who are all from our advisory panel, as well as Vanessa Russ and Len Smith from the Indigenous Data Network, who are also here to answer questions if there are any at the end of the session. So before I start, I want to let you know that this session is being recorded. The primary purpose of today's session is to ensure that we are keeping the community informed of our work on the humanities, arts and social sciences, research data commons and indigenous research capability program. We're really excited as I'm sure all of you are about this long overdue development. And we wanna ensure that we proceed in a transparent and collaborative manner. So during today's session, I'll give a little bit of background about the work of the ARDC, as well as some background about the investment into the HASS RDC and Indigenous Research Capability Program. I'll let you know what progress has been made to date and how you can engage in the planning process over the next month. Today's purpose is not to look at the content of the project plans for the HASS RDC and Indigenous Research Capability Program, but we will let you know later in the session where you can find that content. We will be answering questions at the end of the session, and I'd ask you to add any questions that you might have to the shared document. And I think that Reese has added that link into the chat. So have a look at that shared document. If somebody's already asked your question in that document, you can add a plus one to the column in column three, that is. And that'll help us prioritize the questions so that we can answer them. Rest assured that if we don't get to your question today, we will be answering all of those questions in that document. And we'll make sure that you have the link. We'll email it out to you after the session. So let's start with the ARDC. The ARDC was formed following recommendations of the 2016 National Research Infrastructure Roadmap by merging the Australian National Data Service or ANS, NECTAR, the National Research Cloud and Research Data Services, RDS. It was incorporated in May 2019 and now runs as a not-for-profit company limited by guarantee with 20 institutional members. And we have a skills-based board as well. The ARDC's purpose is simply to provide Australian researchers with competitive advantage through data. We deliver that through accelerating research and innovation by driving excellence in the creation, analysis and retention of high quality data assets. So you can see here the areas of activity that this includes are data and services, storage and compute, software and platforms, and people and policy. In each case, we're driving coordination and coherence in Australia's national digital research infrastructure. OK. 
Okay, so within those four themes, the ARDC is currently running a major program of projects and services. Services include the National Information Infrastructure, the Nectar Research Cloud, and projects include a portfolio of 26 platforms and the National Data Assets Program. And culture change through skills and policy underpins these activities. The ARDC is a hub of expertise connected both domestically and internationally. All ARDC projects are highly collaborative. For example, the Institutional Underpinnings Program is uniting 25 universities to develop a coordinated approach to research data management. 60% of our platforms projects have had more than, have more than 10 institutions involved in them. So we do like to collaborate. The Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences Research Data Commons and Indigenous Research Capability Program will be the first of hopefully many thematic research data commons. The, th the thematic RDCs will bring together data and related resources, so storage, models and computing infrastructure to enable researchers from across disciplines and industries to deliver world-class data intensive research outcomes in strategic thematic areas. The ARDC is shifting towards the support of thematic RDCs because as digital research infrastructure has become mainstream, it has also become clear that the domain specialist should not also have to be a data and compute specialist. As a hub of expertise, the ARDC is positioned to drive best practice in the creation, analysis and retention of high quality data assets and share this expertise across domains. So what is a research data commons actually? A research data commons will co-locate data, storage, and computing infrastructure with core services and commonly used tools and applications for managing, analyzing, and sharing data to create an interoperable resource. Now turning to the Haas Research Data Commons and a little bit of background for you. The need for investment in both humanities, arts and social sciences and Indigenous research was detailed in the 2016 National Research Infrastructure Roadmap. The Department of Education, Skills and Employment, or DESI, subsequently commissioned three studies which identified a number of investment ready programs that would benefit from national research infrastructure funding. Whilst not all of the recommendations of those scoping studies have been funded at this time, the activities earmarked to participate in the initial round of development displayed an advanced state of readiness to participate in and benefit from a Haas Research Data Commons. Funding for the four activities has been guided by the recommended investment ratios in the D studies, DESI studies, even I got it wrong. The leads of those activities are Professor Michael Hoare from UQ for the Linguistics Data Commons of Australia, Dr Stephen McEachan from ANU for Integrated Research Infrastructure for Social Sciences, Alison Dellett for the Trove Research Platform, and Mar uh, Professor Marsha Langton for the Indigenous Research Capability Program. As you know, the ARDC and the HAS RDC and, and Indigenous Research Capability Program are supported as part of the National Research Infrastructure Strategy, NCRIS. And these investments are in response to the National Research Infrastructure Road Mapping Process. We can see this in these project program objectives that reflect the Research Infrastructure Investment Plan, as well as the NCRIS principles. So to date, the activity leads have participated in two workshops. 
The workshops were designed to guide the project plans and ensure that they contribute to the HAS RDC and Indigenous Research Capability Program as a coherent whole. The discussions included opportunities for collaboration or integration across the activities, the potential development of collaborative tools, utilising shared underlying infrastructure and Indigenous data governance considerations. The draft project plans have now been submitted to the ARDC. We've also appointed an advisory panel to ensure that broad community engagement will be achieved and that community feedback will be reasonably incorporated into the project plans. The advisory panel is led by Jill Benn as chair and representative from the Higher Education Library community. Jill is the chair of the Council of Australian University Librarians and University Librarian at UWA, and Jill is with us today. Dr. Kylie Brass is the Academy of the Humanities representative. Kylie is the Policy and Research Director at the Australian Academy of the Humanities. And I believe Kylie's with us too, but there are so many faces that I can't spot her. Dr. Chris Hatherley is the Academy of Social Sciences representatives um, as CEO of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. Associate Professor Anna Johnston is the representative for the researcher community. Anna is Associate Professor in English Literature in the School of Communication and Art at the University of Queensland. Ron Decker is the International Hass Digital Research Infrastructure Representative. Ron is the Director of CESTA ERIC at the Consortium of Social Science Data Archives and the Coordinator of Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud, otherwise known as SHOC. He's also the project leader of the EOSC Future project that aims to realise the European Open Science Cloud. We are still awaiting the appointment of the Indigenous Research Community representative, but that is in progress. So I now want to touch on the project plans, in particular in relation to the evaluation criteria a selection of which you can see here. The project plan evaluation criteria have been strongly tied to the ANCRIS principles. And so to name a few of those principles, Australia's investment in research infrastructure should be planned and developed with a, the aim of maximising the contributions of the research. Major infrastructure should be developed on a collaborative, national, non-exclusive basis Infrastructure funded through NCRIS should serve the research and innovation system broadly, not just the host or funded institution. Funding and eligibility rules should encourage collaboration and co-investment. It should not be the function of NCRIS to support institutional level or even small scale collaborative infrastructure. Access is a critical issue in the drive to optimise Australia's research infrastructure. In terms of increased funding, there should be as few barriers as possible to accessing major infrastructure for those undertaking meritorious research. And due regard must be given to the whole of life costs of major infrastructure. So these are all things to be considered in the evaluation of our project plans. So I just want to share with you the timeline for the next month. It's certainly been a busy time in the lead up to this information session, and it's going to be a busy lead at time in the lead up to our board meeting on the 19th of October. So draft project plans, along with the evaluation criteria and NCRIS principles, as well as a feedback submission facility are now available on the ARDC website. And we'll share that link with you in the chat when, my, when I've finished speaking. 
On the 14th of September, video presentations given by the activity leads, which will give more context to those project plans, will also go live on the ARDC website. On the 21st of September, from 10 until 3 Eastern Standard Time, we will be holding roundtable discussions, which will give you an opportunity to ask any questions of the leads that you may have. Um, as you've registered for today's session, you'll automatically receive details about the roundtable sessions via email. September the 27th will be the last day that you will be able to submit feedback, so please make sure that you add that date to your diary. The leads, the advisory panel and I will be working to ensure that any feedback received is incorporated into the plans where reasonable. But we will also be compiling a register of needs and capabilities that we can't cover in this round. So any capability gaps that we can't cover, we will feed into the current NRI road mapping process through DESI. On the 19th of October, I will be presenting the recommendations for the project plans to the ARDC board. If we feel that any of the plans are not ready, that will not preclude the other activities from getting underway. Okay, thanks for your attention. Uh, we're gonna go to questions now, but I'm gonna ask Reese Williams to give me a hand. And I'll just pop my contact details up there in case anybody wants to get in touch with me via email. So how are we going, Reese? No questions. <laughs> Okay. I can't see any questions in the question register. Now, we can wait a few minutes for someone to type some. If there's not, we may, even though we've got 110 people, we may be able to ask for people to put their hands up, but I'll give you a few more minutes if there's something that you wanted to add to that. And Marcus, while I'm on, while I've got the floor, down the bottom left of where it says mute, if you click on the little arrow on the right, it'll take you to the audio settings. In the in the bottom left of your Zoom window, you should have an uh, Zoom uh, audio settings option. I can't hear you, Jenny. Through you're muted, I think. I'm just going to stop um, sharing my screen and um, find the link for you to the ARDC page that has the project plans and submission feedback. Great. So we'll start on the questions in a minute. Okay, I've just um, popped that link for to the project plans into the chat. So Jenny, there's a couple of questions about Indigenous data governance effectively. The one about care principles, and then is there a universal def definition for Indigenous data governance that we are using? So this sort of related. Um, I'm gonna ask Vanessa or Vanessa Russ or Len Smith, please to address that question. I think you're still muted, Vanessa. This, where, what's the question? The, uh, is there a universal definition for Indigenous data governance? Oh, look, I think that there's, 
there's still work being done. I do think there's quite a lot of work that um, people like Ray Lovett and Maggie have done, but I think in terms of its application, there's still work to work to be done. Um, yep. And the care principles obviously are. It's it's the same thing. I think it's yes. actually about really understanding um, how do you put that into sort of a, a data management setting. How do you actually make it work that people use it? Uh, it's no point talking about it if people aren't going to use it. So I think it's not that there's anything wrong with those things. It's just how do we take them and then apply them? And you know, thinking about the difference between say a community controlled organisation and a non-community controlled organisation, because they're going to be different things as well. So, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm typing, not reading. Um, the Jenny, you, you mentioned the process for recruiting the Indigenous lead. Is, can you give us any more information about that at this stage? Sorry, Reese. You, you mentioned the... <laughs> It's very recruiting. hard. We're in the same room, and it is. It's a bit weird. Um, <laughs> the process for recruiting the indigenous lead. Can you give us any more information about that? Belinda's asked if we've got any more information. You're in the. You mentioned um, it was in leads, progress. Oh no, that's not the lead. Um, the the lead is Professor Marcia Langton. The, the, we are we are looking for um, uh, the advisory panel member. And we've been guided by the Indigenous Data Network and provided with a number of um, people, a few of whom have declined due to the workload and general busyness. So we are working our way through that list that was provided by the Indigenous Data Network. Yep. Um, sound data as a, as a data type. Is there a provision for that? Like, for example, musicology recordings? I presume it could be. Um, as I said, the investment has been very tied to the scoping studies. Uh, so there are those four areas um, that I mentioned. Of course, I'm sure that Michael, is Michael Hall with us? Um, Michael, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> I can't see him in okay. the list. Um, Michael is uh, working with linguistics and obviously linguistics often involves recordings. Um, and I do, uh, are the IDN working with any sound recordings, Vanessa, Len? It's quite likely um, where they're still in the process of identifying clearly which data sets they will be working with, but I will yeah. let them speak. Is that right, Vanessa? Yeah, look, I think um, there, there's, there's a lot to this. It's a massive project. Uh, so trying to get it narrowed down has been really important. Um, and I don't think we're really, I, I'm not sure if we're, we're there in terms of sound. Um, but Lynn, I don't, I don't know. If then somebody in the chat, Jane's told us that the that the language data commons is working with sound, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else? Um, I just noticed that Kylie, I think, was that Kylie Brass had popped a question into the chat. Um, yes. Uh, what's the end game for the program and where do we want to be at the end? Um, at the end, we want to be in the middle, not at the end. <laughs> I would suggest is the answer to that, and maybe not even in the middle. Um, so we view this very much as a, being a pilot to a more long-term piece of research infrastructure. Um, so we do hope that we will be able to expand the capabilities that we're uh, looking at in this phase of the project. Um, and then somebody said, following on from Kylie, how do we best position the Hass community in the ANCRIS roadmap discussions? And I think I might um, ask Rosie Hicks if she can talk roadmap with you. Thanks. 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 Thank you, Thanks. Rosie. Thanks, Jenny. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to split this into two different components here. Uh, the ARDC is obviously very involved in the data and compute components of uh, this year's roadmapping process. 
and I can confirm that we have um, a workshop with uh, the department tomorrow afternoon and we have uh, both representation from um, the Indigenous Network uh, with Vanessa Russ and Len Smith who are on the call this afternoon and from the, the technical side of the HASS RDC, we have Peter Sefton um, representing the interests of the HASS uh, community there. And I, I would put that in context. So we, we have three representatives tomorrow. I'm not sure of the total number of attendees in that meeting, but it's of the order of 2025. So it is a significant footprint, um, which I think is a great result uh, feeding into that process. We, the ARDC, of course, continue to um, advocate for the HASS work in our um, interactions with the road mapping process. In addition to that, I'm not aware of the um, details of the consultation, so I can't add further comment. Okay. Thanks, Rosie. Reese, have we got any more questions? Uh, there are a lot more questions. Oh, uh, lots of questions. There's, there's a question that says, will the commons and the research data be comprised primarily of existing archive data? If so, are any popular archives going to be used at this stage? I mean, I guess it's about, are there existing archives that will be incorporated? That's, that's from how? Um, yes. It, uh, there will be existing data that will be used in these programs. Um, in fact, most of the data is already in existence, I would say. Yeah. Um, and in terms of which archives? Uh, well, Trove, obviously, there will be tapping into Trove data. So, you know, that's a fairly representative group of data from across Australia in terms of LAMS. Um, Paradisic, which is an existing uh, data repository, will be leveraged. ADA is being leveraged, which is an existing data repository for social sciences. Um, IATSIS data will be used. So, yes, there's, there's a lot of reuse of existing um, archival data. Yep, thank you. Uh, a couple of people have asked about the scoping studies. Can we see the scoping studies? Um, the scoping studies that were carried out by DESI uh, have not been made public. Um, one of them I have not seen at all. Two I have, because one of them was done by the ARDC and another was carried out by the Humanities, uh, Academy of Humanities. And I don't no, is Kylie here? I know that the DESI has released that, but I don't think it's been released completely publicly. Yeah, so um, just picking up on that, these scoping studies, I mean, they weren't, can, there's, a, there's a backstory to this, they weren't initially envisaged as the scoping studies, but I think they have effectively become the scoping studies into the process. So as you were saying, um, ARDC did one piece, um, Alexis Tindall was involved in that and in Duncan and, and um, I haven't seen that piece. None of the scoping studies people actually, you know, crossed paths, I guess, in terms of the work that we were doing, even though we were, were swapping intel as we went across the process. There was another study that was done by Dandelo Partners. Um, and again, I know that there was some high level consultation on that, but, but we didn't see that. We did a piece, the Academy of the Humanities, looking at um, international infrastructure models. And at this stage, I've had permission to share that. Oh, look at me with my overalls on. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to be on camera. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so we, we um, were, uh, I've had some permission to share that, as you know, Jenny, with you now and with this, the, the kind of working teams. And I'm working on, on um, hopefully um, getting that um, more publicly available because I think it's a useful resource. Um, and so uh, hopefully there's, there's more to, to tell you soon on that and, and making that publicly available. I do know having spoken to um, counterparts in um, Department of Education that some of that work has been made available to the expert working group, um, a synthesis of it um, as far as I understand. And um, and yeah, so it's a, it's a bit of a watch this space and we're certainly working behind the scenes to get access to those documents more broadly. Thanks, Kylie. 
Oh, it's a work in progress, really. Um, Alex, Alexis has given us a long question. Thanks for that, Alexis. Um, if an organisation is managing Indigenous research data, that would benefit from improved governance arrangements and may benefit communities from being incorporated into any new discoverability made possible by the Commons, what would be the best approach to get involved? Short version, are you seeking collections or open to working with dispersed collections of Indigenous research data? Um, Vanessa and Len, I'm going to throw over to you for that one. That was very well handled. That was very good. You got to take that, Vanessa? Um, uh, I, I think there's multiple end points to that question. I think we, there's lots of things we don't know. Alex, Alex is probably better to email me so that I can actually talk it through with you because, um, you know, there's things around governance that are still new to new to to um, the actual data management side of things, I think. And yeah, there's a lot in that question. If you just send me an email, that'd be great. And I can get that through um, Jenny. Yes, thanks. And that may be one that we can sort of take away and think about a bit. Um, Jules asked about this audience or so everybody on this call. Um, do you have any comments or, about how comfortable you feel with the process that we've outlined for the consultation? So Jenny's taken us through what the proposed time frame is and the steps involved in the consultation. Are people okay with that? I mean, Jill's asking that question as a member of our advisory board for this program. Any comments from anybody? If you have any, think of any and you want to type them into that document um, in, the, in, the, in the response part, you please feel free to do that. Um, Jenny, what else can you see? I think that, that Steve's got his hand up. He had his uh, hand up. I, he put uh, it down I, again. Sorry, I'll, I'll just quick, give a quick comment on the previous question, as I because we, as I, we've been uh, in terms of the working with collections. We, we actually have been. So I've been sort of um, having you know advi helping the the ANU part of the the IDN discussion. We have been looking at models for kind of. Um, uh, audit, you know, doing audits and, and surveys of what collections are available there, and we've been, you know, looking at how to roll that out. So it might, you know, it it might well be the case that there's within that framework of how how we're looking at those data audits that we could fit in the sorts of things that Alexis is talking about. So um, Sam Provost will be able to talk um, talk to that um, as well, uh, and and Vanessa can you know can bring you into touch with those, those relevant people there. But it's say like it, it is certainly within the some of those uh, um, discussions that we've had. Okay, uh, Jenny, a quick question about the timeline for the deliverable. So did you talk about the overall timeline of the program? Overall timeline for the program is uh, we're working to an end date of June, end of June, 2023. So we've got a very tight time frame to deliver on this project program, which is why you can see that we're working in a very tight process of feedback. So we've had to ramp up quite quickly. I only joined the ARDC back in June. So we've been working very quickly to get things properly underway. Okay. What else? We're nearly there, I think. So, uh, advice, do we have any advice for data custodians hoping to make their digital collections accessible through emerging RDCs? I'm not sure who, who's written that in. That might be a rosy through them if we're talking them thematic RDCs more oh. broadly. Oh, and perhaps, yes, does that refer to others other than the HAS RDC perhaps? Does the person who asked that question want to stick their hand up and clarify if they're comfortable to do so? No. No, that's okay. <laughs> the next one says, will the HAS well, data sets in RDA? Well, sorry, Rosie, this, did this, you want to respond? Yeah, I, I will comment. Uh, I noticed that someone's still typing there. Um, but just in case we're talking about other emerging RDCs, um, what I would say is that we anticipate in the next financial year to be able to set up two um, thematic RDCs, 
But at this point in time, we don't know the areas that they will be focused on. We're working that out at the moment. And um, I am absolutely delighted to say that on the 1st of this month, the 1st of September, we appointed Dr. Anitha Cannon as the senior architect for the thematic RDC strategy. Uh, so Anitha's work will be very much on identifying where we start with the first, uh, the first two. Obviously, I see that expanding over the years, um, not, not beyond a handful, uh, but um, certainly for those first two. So when it comes back to having advice for data custodians um, seeking to make collections accessible through emerging RDCs, it is watch this space. There will be further information coming soon. Uh, but of course, making them available through Research Data Australia is a critical, important first step. Now, I hope that's answered the person's question. Um, but if not, I think it's, it's great information to share with this group anyway. Uh, Alexis, you're fessing up. Nice. Um, what, are, what are you saying here? Um, right, well, I've just given a, a lovely, <laughs> I can see you. I've given a lovely example, a lovely answer about thematic RDCs in general, but you are actually focused on this one. Uh, working in an organisation active but nascent digital collections programme. So I'm going to throw back to you, Jenny. Oh, Alexis. <laughs> Sorry, Jenny. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just was say many of us here are custodians of HASS relevant data and um, I think one of the things that's not necessarily clear right at this stage and perhaps it doesn't need to be answered today but perhaps it's something for the further round table is pathways for um, stuff that's already digital um, that we don't necessarily we're not I'm not necessarily turning and asking for money for digitization or anything like that but where our commitments to open scholarship can be turned into accessibility in these new research environments yeah yeah I don't know that I can actually answer that question just yet Alexis um, to be honest with you but uh, as Rosie said, I think it's a matter of watch this space. I mean, I'm incredibly mindful of uh, exactly what you have expressed in that question, but cannot right now answer it. The only thing I can think of is Alexis is a fairly generic answer, but obviously if we're looking at everything that ARDC does is around fair, the fair principles and those kinds of things. So, and we provide a lot of expertise as to this project as we will to others. So if you've got existing resources and you need assistance to make those more available through some, you know, skills work, software development, advice, professional advice, we obviously bring all of that expertise of ARDC to that. So as you know, as probably people know, we've got, a bunch of vocab nerds and PID nerds and developing nerds all in the background doing all sorts of very clever things. Um, that's okay, they know that I call them nerds. It's, it's, a, it's an affectionate term. Uh, got a, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that people are typing in responses, which is really good. Not just asking Jenny and putting her on the spot. Um, Nick Teberger says, can FAIR be FAIR if it doesn't include long-term guaranteed curation of research data? Well, I mean, it, it's, um, it, it can. Uh, it's got to be as long as possible, but who's going to give a, an ironclad guarantee? Um, my colleague, Keith Russell, said if people want to establish a PID for something, he should give them a puppy because it's a long-term arrangement. So we all, we all just fairly willy-nilly establish a PID for something, uh, but that's no different to putting it to arguing the same thing about a long-term repository. So I'm being a bit flippant, but you're quite, you're quite right, Nick. That is a principle we have to get right. And thank you to Alexis for her comment. Um, agree that it is an important question to be on it the is. table. Thank you. Yeah. We need to keep having that discussion, Alexis. Yeah. Are there any more, Reese? Uh, there's one that says us about thematic RDC concept differing from existing NRI facilities and funding. That's a rosy question, I That's think. That's a rosy right? question. That's definitely a, a rosy question. Um, there is a very significant difference to the way that the ARDC has been operating historically. 
Um, we have undertaken support and collaborations with a significant number of national data assets and platforms programs, uh, producing some really fantastic research capability. But much of this has come about through an open call process. Um, and we are acutely aware that uh, digital research infrastructure is no longer at the vanguard. It's absolutely underpinning the mainstream um, of our research. So we have to change the way that we do this to ensure that we can support the needs of the greatest number of researchers to have the highest impact. And so we, uh, in putting together the thematic RDCs, we're looking to make significant strategic investments, very much uh, in the same model, building on the model of what we're doing here with the Haas RDC, that are brought about by um, significant consultation and facilitation and building the communities to identify the gaps and the challenges and going forward to build those solutions rather than an open um, competitive process, building this shared national research infrastructure. And I think another really important point uh, that we need to speak to here is the sustainability of our e-research infrastructure. And if we continue to fund in short bursts and to funding projects, uh, we're not looking at the sustainability issue. If there is a national need uh, to have this capability as the national research infrastructure, the ARDC has to commit longer than a three year window. Now, of course, it's limited by uh, the existence of the ARDC, minor point there, but beyond that, uh, we then come back to reviewing the impact of having a particular capability and the demands of the research sector. So it is a significant shift um, between the way that things have been done previously, uh, recognizing the mainstream needs of the research sector and what we think is necessary for the next 10 years. Reese, you are typing furiously. Um, I wonder, we might put a link to the ARBC website that explains this in a bit more detail for everyone that's on the call today. Does that to help? The, yes. Thematic, yeah, we've got we've got something on the thematic RDCs on, on the website. We have indeed. Yep. So I'll, yeah, I'll, you I'll can tell it. by the length of my answer um, that it's a very exciting uh, time for us. So thank you. Um, thank you, Rosie. And, and is there anything else there, Jenny? I'll just stop looking at it. Um, There's a comment there about knowing where it fits into the international initiatives. I think that sort of goes well with the previous comments about knowing what's there in terms of mapping existing data collections. There's a piece that there's a sort of a landscape or environmental piece that's amongst that, um, I think. Um, thank you for, Rosa, did you paste that? Thank you. That, no? was Ke that was Keith. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Keith. Keith is the keeper of the, uh, the, the guru of finding the right thing and sticking it in there. Thanks, Keith. Um, Yeah, okay. And I've pasted your comment in there, Nick. Jenny, can you think of anything else we should cover off? I'm just having a quick look in the chat. No, I can't think of anything else unless there are any further questions. Steve's got his hand up. Have you, Steve? Yeah. Um, uh, Jenny, I, I just thought it might be useful to back back to um kylie's point about end of you know what's the what's the end game here and your your, your point about this is the end of part one um and because uh, i think that helps for people to understand when they're you know when they're evaluating and reviewing what we've what we kind of put together to understand we focused on there is going to be a part two you know that's the premise that we're, we're really working towards and as a result um some of what we've written into those plans is premised on we can't do everything straight away, but we certainly we're trying to set it up for thinking forward there. And so let's say that lines up with the road mapping discussions and others um, that, uh, that that Rosie and Jenny have touched upon. But that point about there, 
implicit in this is assuming a part two. And so some of the questions around what's in and what's out is which parts can we get, can we do now and which parts can we be ready for as we go forward is, is kind of embedded in certainly you know, some of the thinking that the, the social science group has done. And I think with across the other projects as well. Okay. Thanks, Steve. And thus also our desire to capture feedback that will um, help shape, you know, what future capability we might, the, the sector might um, benefit from that we can't meaningfully create in this round. Thanks, Steve. Anybody else? Yes, it is recorded and it will be made available. Vanessa, can I just follow on from what Steve just said that I think one of the components for us is actually uh, there's a lot of consultation and engagement required. So it, there's still quite a lot of conversation that's required from our end. And I think um, we're, all, we're all feeling the pinch. So it, it's not that we, we don't know certain things. It's just that how do you make them functional is, is out there and, and we need to bring all the people, the right people into the room. And so that still takes, there's still work to be done, so to speak. Thanks, Vanessa. Great. Lynn's asking, is long-term sustainability job for ADC or for NCI? Rosie? I think we all have a part to play. Yep. Uh, there is certain data that most appropriately sits with NCI. Um, there is data, we, we're looking for that seamless uh, connection across government data, health data, industry data, community data. Um, I think ARDC has a significant role in working to um, raise the the tide, I think, if I, if I go back to that, all ships rise with the tide, working with the institutions across Australia uh, to raise the um, availability and standards of institutional repositories um, so that they expand beyond the, the strengths of publications and uh, really address the responsibilities for maintaining data into the future. Um, then add to that some domain specific repositories and our need as um, a country of, what are we up to today? 26 million in a broader global landscape and need to make sure um, that we are also interoperable and working with global um, data as well. Thank you, Rosie. Anybody else? We make it an early minute. <laughs> so I encourage you to have a look at those project plans. Um, at the moment, there's, a, there's three project plans available. Um, all four will be available tomorrow. Um, we just had to rectify something in one of them. So they'll all be up there tomorrow. Uh, please take a look. Please have a look at the videos. They will be up on the 14th of September and then come back and participate with us in the roundtable discussions with it, where we'll have a much longer time to discuss those plans in detail with the project leads and their partners. Um, and then I really strongly encourage you to submit your feedback because, as I say, that will help us to shape what capabilities the community needs going forwards. So I, I'm really glad that you've attended today. And if you have any questions that you think of after the session, either pop them into that shared document or you can email me, but we'll keep working on that shared Q&A document just so that everyone can read the answers. And I think we will sign out. So thanks again for attending. And I'll see you at the round table in a, in a few weeks time. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thanks, Reese. Thanks, Rosie and Vanessa and Len.
and my advisory panel. Thank you very much for attending.